Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, is there a motion for approval of the agenda? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the agenda as written. Support. Please call the vote. Mr. Williams, yes. Dr. Early? Yes. Mr. Grunberg? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Rayford? No. Mrs. Richardson? Yes. And Mrs. Grunberg? Yes. Is there a motion for the consent agenda? I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Support. Please call the vote. Dr. Early? Yes. Mrs. Grunberg? Yes. Mr. Grunberg? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mrs. Rayford? No. Mrs. Richardson? Approve and support A and B. Next item is Superintendent's Report, Superintendent Gibson. Uh, good evening, Board President, um, and good evening to those of you watching remotely or from home. Um, this is your Superintendent's Report for February 12th, 2024. Uh, we'll continue focusing on those moments that matter and the work of our schools impacting the lives of students. Congratulations to seniors Nyana Burks and Devin Kimsky who are honored at the annual Macomb Career Tech Education Administrators Association Awards Breakfast. Uh, they were each nominated by our CTE Director and Culinary Arts Program Chef Shoemake. Um, Devin was the first East Point High School student awarded a $500 McTee scholarship. And Weld Alloy of Warren is our business partner, was recognized at this awards. Congratulations to Nayana and Devon. Digging into the portrait of a graduate across the district, staff have been digging into the portrait of a graduate. Pictured here is Bellevue Elementary School who started to take the portrait of a graduate and define what are the important key skills that children would need in grades three through five. This work has also been replicated at the high school level where building uh, staff are learning the components of a por portrait of a graduate and how they can live into those components. I ready and secondary math implementation and training. Across the district, I think it's key to note to the community and the board that the board takes action and improves a curriculum. However, just when the board takes action is not where it ends. There is a lot of work that goes into a successful curriculum implementation. Pictured here is a slide from the East Point, Mass, uh, East Point High School Math Department. Um, and joining us in our audience as well is the Director of Curriculum and um, Assessment, Lisa Petrella. But I want to give a shout out to Lisa and the curriculum team, which is comprised of district coaches. Um, they have developed a strategy implementation guide to help teachers to understand the components that are necessary when using our iReady curriculum across the district. Pleasant View staff have also dug into iReady data during professional learning. So as a system, it's important that we have ongoing job embedded coaching for our teachers. We also have instructional learning routines where Lisa and some of our instructional coaches and principals go into classrooms to see how the implementation of the curriculum is going. Um, and to see that the learning routines that are taught in iReady are being implemented across the district. For us, it's really important to make sure that if you're a third grader at Bellevue and you're a third grader at Pleasant View, you're getting the same access. That's part of what equity is, is access to the same content. Um, and our work in a guaranteed and viable curriculum is paying off. We saw a number of our students who had been less than proficient start to move up into obtaining more skills at this year's winter NWEA. So thank you, Lisa, as well as all of the members of the curriculum team and instructional coaches across the district. 
We are in the throes of a pilot adoption for a curriculum for ELA K-5. Um, on February 14th this week, the K-5 ELA pilot team, um, each school has about three teachers that are part of the pilot team. Uh, they will be trained on the second curricular resource. Uh, the first resource was benchmark assessment uh, that was piloted, and now we will be piloting the iReady version of ELA. The teams pilot one curricular unit. They get trained on the curriculum materials. They pilot the unit. And then Lisa and her team have interim check-ins where they conduct Zoom meetings to, with the teachers to find out how the curriculum implementation is going. So a huge shout out to a few of our K-5 teachers who are piloting the new ELA resources. Amy Epinato at Crescentwood, Angela Mole, Miranda Blaz, Caitlin White, Caitlin Gray, Lauren Robinson, Ed Crane, Brooke Van Ree, Jennifer Sands Boskett, Jasmine Goines, Monica Castillo, and Jessica Federico. We actually had more teachers than we could pick who were passionate about piloting a new curriculum. And this says something about the caliber of our teachers, and it also says that they are hungry for a new ELA curriculum to support their reading instruction in their classroom. So a big shout out to all of the teachers who give of themselves to pilot new things and also to our curriculum team. Thank you to Senator Veronica Kleinfeld and State Representative in the House, Kimberly Edwards, who joined at East Point High School last week, the Women of Tomorrow. Rebecca Sarisa has been running the Women of Tomorrow, I think for the better part of nine years, she said, at East Point High School. And it is a mentoring program for young women. Um, Kimberly Edwards did a fantastic job of modeling and sharing more about what a House representative does. And State Senator Veronica Kleinfeld talked more about how through um, disagreements in the House and the Senate and how the work is done in Lansing. Uh, we should be honored to have two amazing women representing our community. And I appreciate the time that they took out of their busy schedules uh, to meet with our East Point High School young ladies and learn more about the work. Thank you to both Senator Kleinfeld and State Representative Kimberly Edwards. Attendance matters, and it matters across this district. Um, and we'll continue to celebrate all of the princes and the queens and all of the various celebrations that are going on. But I don't know if you guys notice that our numbers are increasing <laughs> because of all of the recognition that our kids have been getting coming to school regularly. Bellevue and Pleasant View have been continuing to recognize students with perfect attendance. So congratulations to all the students pictured. I think uh, at Bellevue there was even an indoor snowball fight um, as a reward for their perfect attendance. East Point High School had an honor roll breakfast last week. Nearly 90 students, both of East Point High School and of the eighth grade academy, um, we're invited to attend a second quarter honor roll breakfast with pancakes, breakfast sandwiches served by the culinary arts students. It was a fantastic breakfast, and it was a great opportunity to meet some of the faces of East Point High School. Um, and the kids were fantastic. They had a bouncer who was collecting tickets at the door, and our own students. <coughs> Um, I say bouncer because he was taking his job very seriously. Only ticketed students were allowed in the breakfast. But to be, in, <laughs> to be, but to be supported uh, by students for other students, I sat in the breakfast and talked to the kids, and they were so honored to be noticed and to see, be seen for their achievements. So um, thank you to Principal Todd Yarch, the CTE Culinary students who have had a busy few weeks offering um, breakfast and meals to um, students and the community. Shamrock Competitive Cheer and Wrestling. For those of you that have not been following along recently, Competitive Cheer was newly returned to East Point High School. I talked to um, Valerie Jens, who is the coach this year and helping to bring back the program. Um, the students competed in two of the three sessions. 
um, and they increased 19 points in the round one competition and 12 points in the round two. Uh, and they did not have the competitive cheer fundamentals when they started. So the growth from our um, cheerleaders was exponential. Uh, Caitlin Keenitz took a number of pictures and showed me all the times the girls were perfectly in sync. So congratulations, ladies, um, and congratulations for Coach Jens for the hard work. Our wrestling team did wrap up their season last week, drawing matches against De La Salle. Um, congratulations to our wrestlers for a great season. A signing day. So last week, East Point High School seniors Jordan Brooks, Corchan Holt, and Philip Kane each signed to play basketball at Detroit Community Christian, excuse me, football at Detroit Community Christian College next fall. Congratulations to the athletes. And a big thank you to Russell Ball and Shannon Elliott for the signing day setup and the opportunity to be featured. Internal facilities master plan. This evening we'll be joined by Wolpert for a virtual presentation on the research and the work going into the district-wide study of the buildings and all of our properties. After this presentation, the team will be sharing some possibilities with the central office, as well as then the central office team will be working to provide opportunities for the community to be involved in feedback. Uh, this is part of our School 5 strategic plan implementation, and we'll learn more about that in the Woolpert presentation to follow. Upcoming events, February 19th through 20th, there is no school. It is a change from last year, families. We will be off on Monday and Tuesday. Um, there will be school this Friday. February 24th is Macomb Reads at the south campus of Macomb Community College, where East Point Community Schools has had an integral part in planning this celebration. We will be celebrating an author and also taking and scaling up the Wax Museum that was very popular at Pleasant View Elementary School and taking that out on the road at the south campus of Macomb Community College. Families, please stay aware. We will be also offering transportation so that you too can attend um, this event on Saturday, February 24th. There is no school on February 27th. We will be closing the schools for the primary election. We will be moving our whole group gathering and welcoming Dr. J. Marks, who is a DEIJ um, trainer for professional learning. We will be extending opportunities to the community through local churches and through the city offices here if anybody is interested in learning more about the work by Dr. J. Marks or uh, being part of our gathering. We would welcome the opportunity. Please communicate through the superintendent's office if you are interested in attending. February 29th will be our Gleaners Mobile Food Distribution. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Correct. Um, statute, in the federal law, we are required to have a continuity of services plan. This was a law put into place during the COVID times as it pertained to the ARP ESSER funds. Um, we reviewed our plan initially at the beginning of the school year and then are required to re-review the plan every six months throughout the life of the grant year. Um, this evening, I will be reviewing the plan, and then public comment will be open during the hearing of the public regarding the continuity of service plan. Our return to learn plan can be found on East Point Community Schools' website and has not been changed from its original presentation at the beginning of this year. Uh, we will continue to offer full day face-to-face -face learning. Uh, we do offer a hybrid model on a case-by-case -case basis determined by the student support team and or through the office of the superintendent. That concludes the information regarding the return to learn plan. Thank you so much. Okay, next, on the agenda. Yes, next on the agenda is hearing of the public. We'll open that up at 646. Um, Reminder that it, not only is this for the con continuity of services plan, 
but this is also our general hearing of the public that uh, you can come up and speak to any topic you want to as well. Um, does anyone wish to be heard? Anyone wish to be heard? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing of the public at 646. Next, discussion, action, human resources. Do we have a motion in support of instruction of new hires EFE? I'll make a motion that we uh, accept the new hires. <coughs> I second. Questions, comments? Please call the vote. Mr. Williams, yes. Mrs. Grunberg? Yes. <clears throat> hmm? Yes. Okay. Mr. Grunberg? Yes. Dr. Early? Yes. Mrs. Rayford? Yes. Mrs. Richardson? Yes. Motion carries. Next curriculum. We have a presentation. Yes. Principal at East Point Middle School, and I'm excited to be here this evening um, to share with you the amazing work that's happening with our sixth and seventh graders over at the middle school. I want to start this evening by sharing our instructional celebrations. Our focus is going to be specifically on math. and it's going very very well this curriculum is embedded with opportunities for students to work with math manipulatives to engage in critical thinking conversations with their peers while being um, exposed to grade level math concepts the program gives our teachers a lot of great opportunities as well specifically when it comes to data our teachers are able to immerse themselves into uh, data that is specific to the iReady curriculum, including iReady Diagnostic, which students are given three times a year, which serves as an additional data point to assess the needs of our students. The great thing about our math team is that they don't just stop with giving the assessments. They work diligently with our instructional coach to make sure they use that data to guide their future instruction and provide intervention opportunities. One of those intervention opportunities is going to be our after school targeted math tutoring program. This program is for students who just need that extra little push. They're almost to grade level, and per the diagnostic in our NWEA, we know that they can get there, and so we're targeting those students and inviting them to be a part of our after school program so that we can give them those, fill in those gaps, mostly with the foundational skills so that we can see them performing on grade level. In addition to our core math classes, this semester we're really excited to offer a STEM elective. This elective will take both math and science concepts to a new level and give students the opportunity to, to design projects that address real world needs and hopefully give them some insight into possible future careers. And the great thing about this design class is that they get to, to work with a lot of hands-on materials. And the goal here is that we can spark an interest that maybe they didn't know they had, is so that we can move forward with programs such as robotics in the coming years. I'm going to skip over uh, our NWEA, and I'm going to come back to that. So I'm going to jump to ELA before I loop back to NWEA. In ELA, this year, we piloted the My Perspectives program, and it has been going extremely well. If you were to walk into any of our ELA classrooms, you would see students engaged in textbook readings, workbook activities, and small group discussions. 
the best part and the most exciting part about the My Perspectives curriculum is that the reading takes our students on an adventure. I've walked in the classrooms where our students have been immersed in the Wild West, where students have been to outer space, and most recently in our seventh grade classroom where they are following a hitchhiker from Florida to California. And it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun, and it's great to make some of those out-of-the-box connections for our students, but it's just such uh, a joy to see see uh, our sixth and seventh grade students engaged in those in those reading um, in those different texts. One area uh, that the instructional team as well as the school improvement team really wanted to focus on when it came to ELA was, identi was identifying those students who are not reading on grade level. It was our priority to continue to provide our students with material that met their needs while still exposing them to grade level content. So what our team did is we retested all of our sixth and seventh grade students using the corrective reading program. In that program, it let us know where those major gaps are. And based off that test, we placed our students in either decoding classes, which is going to be that very basic class where we address those skills that maybe were missed in the lower grades. And some, or some students are placed into comprehension classes that are also going to be tiered. So some students might be in a comprehension A class, B class, C class. The best thing about this program or this initiative to really focus on intervention is that our students can move out of those classes as well. So we have a criteria that's been set based off our data and our progress monitoring where we can identify if students are ready to move on so we can continue to address those uh, unique needs of our students. Now I want to loop back to NWEA. So we, as you know, we do three, we test three times a year. Uh, we finished did our fall testing right at the beginning of the year and just finished our, our winter testing recently. And this year, as we, as our school improvement team and our instructional team talked about where we wanted to go with our NWEA, the focus was we really wanted to create a data-driven environment in our school. We know that for middle schoolers, they want to know the why. They want to know why we're doing everything we do. And we wanted to give our NWEA testing sessions purpose, and that's exactly what we did. We decided that there were two best practices that we wanted to adopt. The first was conversation, and the second was visuals. So between the fall and winter testing sessions, our first hour teachers committed to having data chats with, with each and every one of their first hour students. Those chats included talking about what their scores were in math and ELA, talking about where we wanted them to go, and then committing to steps that students would take to get there. In addition to those data chats, we also had each first hour teacher create a data wall. And that data wall would show the growth anonymously. Each student was given a number that was private to them, and it would show their growth throughout all three tests. I believe that these initiatives were very successful. And as we look at our winter data, we saw improvement across most grade levels with 53% with of our sixth graders and 46% of our seventh graders making growth in math and 54% of students in both sixth and seventh grade making growth in ELA. Truly, we know there's work to be done, but I'm really proud of my instructional team at the middle school and all the work that we're doing to move that instructional needle. So our instructional growth would not be possible without our non-instructional initiatives that we, have been, that we have put in place this year. The first one, which I'm most excited about, we can go to the next slide, uh, is, going to, is our Positive View. So the Positive View program is an SEL pro, uh, curriculum that has been adopted by many uh, Macomb County uh, schools surrounding school districts. The positive view purpose of this program is to provide students with a toolbox of skills to address everyday challenges both in and out of school. At EMS, first hour teachers implement the curriculum four days a week. The only day they don't implement it will be Wednesdays because it's that late start day. Each month, a positive view representative holds an assembly and kicks off the theme for the month, which happens to be kindness in the month of February. Every Monday, first hour teachers show their students a video and then walk through a lesson that challenges students to have vulnerable conversations, journal, and work together to solve problems. 
And on the screen, I have an example of that video. Um, this is what our students watched today. Not going to work. <laughs> oh, bummer. So I am happy to pass that video along. Uh, these videos are great. And the cool thing, and what you see, you see Mr. Aaron on the video right now. Mr. Aaron is actually the representative that comes to our school. And our kids just get really excited when he's there. And it's almost like a celebrity when you see uh, Aaron and, and Kenny, who's the other person on the video. When you see them walk in, um, it's like they're, they're best friends. <laughs> they already know them because they're so involved in those videos. And those videos are, they're short. They're only two and a half minutes, but they're fun and engaging. On Tuesdays, our building rep, Mr. Aaron, uh, comes to EMS and he pulls a focus group from each grade and engages in small group work around the theme for the month. Our BTN identified students for that focus group and those are students who we felt would benefit just from that additional small group time um, and also just from having a mentor, which is what Mr. Aaron um, provides for our students. Finally, the Positive U team provides three professional development sessions for our staff. Last time, the session focused on mental health challenges and gave staff resources and strategies to assist in our work. The program has been an excellent addition to the, to the mission of EMS. The next piece is going to be our PBIS uh, rewards program. So this is an important piece to our EMS puzzle. We are fortunate to have an incredible at-risk social worker, Makia Fullwood, who works diligently to encourage positive behavior and, and, to be, and have that behavior be celebrated on a monthly basis. This is celebrated through monthly incentives, which you see up on the screen. This month, we are having a Valentine's Day dance on Wednesday um, and a sk skating party next month. In December, we hosted a holiday movie afternoon. Students must earn each incentive based off a certain number of PBIS points, which is based off positive behavior. If a student does not want to participate in those activities, they do have an option to shop at our PBIS store once a quarter to use those points. So they still have an opportunity to, uh, have to celebrate that positive behavior. I wholeheartedly believe that PBIS has changed the mindset and the way that we interact with students at EMS. When positive student behavior is celebrated, we see a decrease in negative behaviors. Our BTN continues to analyze the PBIS data and to make changes as necessary, but the program has been incredibly beneficial for our students. And finally, the last piece is our parent engagement activities. As we know, uh, success cannot happen without parent involvement and support, and we have taken every opportunity possible to invite our parents into our building. We invite them in to not just share feedback and have those crucial conversations, but we invite them in to also have fun. This month, this month, we kicked off a monthly parent meeting called Pancakes with the Principal. During this meeting, parents are given valuable information about upcoming school events. They talk, we talk about reminders about school policies and we present resources outside of the school. This month, we gave parents information about the Boys and Girls Club and talked to them about how at EMS we support their child's enrollment in that, with that organization. Throughout the, the meetings, parents are encouraged to voice their concerns, to ask questions, and to engage, engage in those tough conversations. You can kind of see the, the pancake poster up there. It's my principal, our pancakes with the principal's um, meeting. There is a, a um, a scan code up there, a QR code, and that was sent out to parents. They did have the opportunity to scan that code and to ask questions ahead of time uh, if they wanted to, because we wanted to make sure that their voices were heard. The first meeting was a success, and I'm looking forward to continuing this each month. In addition to the pancakes with the principal, we are constantly inviting our parents into the building for fun and exciting family events. In addition to the family carnival that we had in September, we hosted a holiday movie night and we'll be hosting a winter wonderland family dance on February 23rd, which will include a dinner for our families. We do not work as an island at EMS, and I'm excited to continue to open our doors to our families and work together to provide the best opportunity for our EMS students. Thank you very much.
Yeah, it's a great question. So it's it's on a uh, so it's on an app, and we so all of our teachers have an app um, that they use. They can also log in on their on their computers, and students can receive points. I believe the categories are being helpful, being respectful. Um, there's like four or five different categories that they're aware of, and they can receive anywhere from one to three points, and that's how those points add up. What's really cool is you can go into the cafeteria, and our uh, security team, our A team, hall monitors, they can go in uh, and they can give points to students our secretaries can give points to students our paras can give points to students um, so it opens up a lot of opportunities for them to be celebrated for those positive behaviors but it is broken down into a couple of categories uh, again like being helpful respectful um, can't can't quite think of the others but there are there are specific categories they can receive points in Time while you're waiting for the there it goes my technology to kick in. I'm Carrie Ann Wolf, and I'm so happy to be here with you this evening. John Beckelheimer is here with me as well. Um, I'm actually uh, currently housed in Columbus, Ohio, and John is out in California. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, anything or much about our uh, firm, uh, we are a firm we were acquired last summer. Uh, we were previously cooperative strategies. And um, we have been a nationwide company, uh, cooperative strategy for over 25, 30 years, and now with Wolford, a global company uh, that it actually serves uh, five continents, about 2,000 employees. Um, I personally have been with Wolford, um, excuse me, it, with cooperative strategies and now Wolford for about 21 years. And um, I uh, have come to this work as a, a teacher. Um, I held a degree in K-12. Uh, I taught in public schools in a suburb of Cleveland. I taught in the state of Maryland. Uh, and uh, very happy to have been doing this work. So it's master planning, educational specifications, and mobile projections, capacity studies, and other, other uh, services that we provide as well. So uh, to t let you know a little bit about what we're going to be doing tonight, 
talk to you somewhat about our process, um, how they align with your goals and strategies, share some uh, high-level financial and facility data. We had some conversations with your uh, administrative team about educational adequacies of the facilities, and then we'll do a high-level summary, next steps, and have time for Q&A. Um, in addition to myself, as I mentioned, John is on the call with me. John, I'll give you a moment to introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. My name is John Beckelheimer. I've been with our firm for about six years now. I work mostly on finance projects. I have a degree in finance um, and very excited to be working with everybody. Thanks, John. And David Sertz is also part of our team. He's not with us this evening, but he'll be continuing to support our team as we move through the process. So here's a very high level view of uh, our long range facilities master plan. Um, we do these processes throughout the country with um, small rural districts, large urban districts, suburban districts, and everyone in between. Um, we have a general process that we follow that can be more community and uh, committee robust and some that's a little more internal. This one is a little more of an internal process where we have some community engagement. Um, we uh, had a kickoff meeting in the fall. We did kind of a plan for planning. We've been uh, collecting background information, which you'll see tonight. Um, and we're continuing to refine and define the educational division, uh, excuse me, educational vision. Uh, we'll use that educational vision to help define facilities options. We know this is a long range facilities plan. And um, we have internally started, when I say internally, David, John, and I have started to look at what some potential facility options could be uh, based on the preliminary data that we have uh, the, thus far. Um, kind of our, I'm kind of jumping to the beginning with the end in mind here. Um, after tonight's presentation, one of the things that we will do is continue that internal conversation, David, John, and I, and we'll bring that conversation to uh, Ms. Gibson and uh, Robert and have some additional internal conversations with them about what some facility options might be. Uh, we look at what the challenges are and what some potential solutions to those are through your facilities. And we'll come back to you all in March, I believe your March 24th meeting, something like that, with um, some options for you all to, um, to take a look at. Uh, there would be draft at that point. Um, and options that we, you think might be appropriate then to bring out to the community at large. And um, we'll have the opportunity for the community to have input on what those facility options are. And um, once we get that uh, feedback from the community, we align that with the other information that we've gathered. When we talk about developing options and taking that forward to a recommendation, we always want to be mindful that um, there are lots of pieces of data that go into configuring a facility option and an ultimate recommendation. So there's um, capacity, uh, educational adequacy of a facility, enrollment projections, the condition of a facility, the community input, and all of those things are kind of equal in the equation to how we develop options and how we develop recommendations. So we'd be doing that somewhat internally with our team continue to bring that back to Christina and Robert, and then in between bring it back to you all and take it out to the community, but to ultimately bring it back to you all for a recommendation near the end of the process. So we know that you have a strategic plan. We know what your goals and strategies are. The work that we're doing most appropriately aligns with your fifth goal of resources, finances, facilities, and technology, and most appropriately aligns with your aligned strategies, exploring uh, facility reorganization or consolidation. So that's kind of the the uh, piece where this process fits into your uh, current uh, strategic plan. So I want to talk to you for just a moment about some kind of what I'll call like industry standards, so to speak. So one of the things that we look at kind of at high level with all the districts that we work with is, you know, what has typically been your um, capital outlay for facilities over the last five to ten years. Um, generally, when you look at the cost of uh, maintaining a school, 
want to look at what is the square footage of that school, what is the current replacement cost of that school, and take about 2% of that cost to uh, replace that school and budget that amount to maintain that school. And so um, you're in a similar boat to other public school districts around the country. Usually as an industry standard, we say take 2% of your total replacement costs of all your facilities, and that's what you should hold in your budget. When we look at your square footage, it's a, uh, for purposes of this, I'm going to use real round numbers. But you see that your square footage is at 645,000 square feet. Um, current replacement costs, just for costs, not soft costs like architect fees and and uh, that kind of thing, would be about 500, just straight construction costs. So the replacement of your current uh, inventory or portfolio facilities would be about $322 million. And um, so that's just to replace what you have in kind, not making any changes to sizes or that kind of thing. So if you were going to take 2% of that value, you would want to hold about $6.4 million in your budget each year to maintain and operate your facilities. Um, and what we know is that in the last five years, you've gotten some additional uh, grants and funding and so on that have allowed you to come a little closer to that $6.4 million. You're at kind of $2.4 million. But the previous five years, you were kind of in the five to $600,000 range. And that's kind of an average of those previous five years. This is not uncommon for public school districts. But what this shows us in a very quick and graphic format is that um, if you're not uh, if you don't have that level of budget to maintain your facilities from year to year, we know that you continue to accrue uh, deferred maintenance costs from year to year, and facilities continue to fall into disrepair, which I'm sure that you're well aware of. But this is just another uh, graphic to kind of illustrate that point and kind of give you a benchmark from you know where you are to what industry standards. We had a conversation recently internally and I said, you know, does any district ever reach this 2%? Does any district ever really hold almost $7 million from year to year? And the answer is rarely uh, because the other, other priorities uh, pop up from year to year. So, nonetheless, um, we do know that you did pass a bond. Congratulations on that. Uh, we know that's a large effort especially when um, you have to put a lot of effort into figuring what goes into the bond uh, to get folks in support of that. So congratulations. I'm sure you're aware of um, the allocation for each uh, uh, location in your district. So this just kind of breaks it down what the planned allocation is for each uh, facility, the elementary, middle, and high level, and at the uh, early childhood center excuse me, Early Learning Center, as well as the Operations and Transport Center. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the Facilities Condition Index, but I want to give you a definition of that before we jump into that slide to talk about your facilities specifically. So a Facilities Condition Index basically takes the amount of a facility to replace it versus the amount of a facility to uh, fix or renovate that particular facility. And so sometimes you kind of compare this to owning a car. You know, you have a 10-year-old car, you take it in, and they say it needs a new transmission, and it's going to cost $4,000. And so you have to weigh, is it, is, it more, uh, is, it, is it more wise to replace your car at that point or to put $4,000 into it? So you kind of have to look at what is the replacement value versus what is the repair value. So similar kind of thing, a facilities condition index takes what is the value or what are the costs to repair, maybe the systems, maybe the HVAC and the roofs and the, the exterior sidewalks or the playground, whatever the systems might be in your facility, what are the costs to repair those versus the cost to replace in kind that particular facility. And you look at the ratio of one against the other. And as the number of the FCI, or the Facility Condition Index, FCI, Facility Condition Index, as that value goes up, the condition of the facility gets poorer and poorer. So if you see that the uh, 
FCI, the facility condition index, is very low, that's a good number. Um, the higher the number, the worse condition the facility is in. So that's kind of a, a um, overall summary of what you're seeing on the screen here. And uh, oh, I want to give you one other data point before we look at your facility specifically. The other data point is on the left hand side of this matrix, you see physical condition, good, fair, poor, which kind of echoes that previous slide, good, fair, poor of the facility condition index. Along the bottom, you have your utilization spectrum, so to speak. Um, generally, you want your utilization, which is the comparison of your enrollment to the capacity of the facility. So let's say the capacity of a facility is 500, meaning if I filled every room, every period, I could fit 500 students into that facility. That's the capacity. The enrollment is how many students are attending that building this year, right? And so, Forgive me if I'm dumbing some things down for those of you that may already know these, but um, I would like to just make sure that we're all on the same ground for, um, for understanding. So nonetheless, utilization, enrollment, how many students are enrolled, capacity. If we compare those two against each other, we generally want the, the facility to be utilized. It'd be lovely if it could be utilized at 100%, but that's not realistic. We can't fill every room, every period, all day long to its maximum reality is we, we serve students somewhere between ideally about 75 to 85 um, percent. So we want to create facilities that are highly utilized, highly resourced, as well as being in good condition. And so you'll see in just a minute where your facilities lie in their utilization, uh, where the enrollment is, what the capacity is, and also what the facility condition is. Uh, shows. So without further ado, let's take a look at your facilities. And, some, and I know that you received this in advance. Some of you probably had a chance to digest this more than others. Um, but if not, we'll just walk through it here together. So the first column is just the campuses. The second column is the grade level. The third column is the approximate acreage that those uh, facilities are all sitting on. And why is that important? Well, generally, we want a, an elementary school to be served at least 10 acres in a, at a middle school at about, about 20 acres and a high school at about 35 acres because it allows for appropriate uh, bus and pick up and drop off, parent pick up and drop off, pedestrian walkways, appropriate parking, playgrounds, play fields, all of those things in addition to the facility itself. Um, and then we have the gross square foot of the facility, which takes into account not only the, the classrooms and that kind of thing, but gross square foot includes things like, you know, hallways and, and um, elevators if you have two stories, that kind of thing. So the 2024 FCAS is 2024 Facility Condition Assessment Estimation. So you had a facility assessment done in 2020. And so the escalated uh, values of those the uh, to the 2024 dollars, our, our best estimate of that um, is, is that column. So the facility condition index takes what the cost to replace, for example, the East Point Learning Center against the cost to renovate that. And when we look at the amount to renovate it versus the amount to replace it. The FCI, that facility condition index that I was talking about previously, is at 70%. So of the facilities that you own, that particular facility is in the poorest condition. The maintenance and transportation center, on the other hand, is at a 27 FCI. Remember when I said the, num the lower the number, the better the condition of the facility. And then your other facilities lie somewhere in between. Uh, you know, you, you see some there in the 30s, some in the 50s, some in the 60s. So the FCI uh, kind of falls in that in that range, and you see overall district-wide, you're at about a 46% FCI. And so that indicates to me that overall, as a district, you would probably want to lean towards probably lean towards renovation, but there are some that would lean towards replacement. And uh, that's the kind
kind of data that we'll be looking at, John and David and I, as we continue to develop these options. And then, of course, the last column is the capacity. How many students could these uh, facilities hold? Capacity is a um, number that can fluctuate over time uh, for lots of reasons. Um, one of the reasons it fluctuates is how programs are currently being delivered. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we were sitting in rows and all looking at the teachers ahead, and we were not doing a lot of group or collaboration work. We weren't serving as many special students, that kind of thing. And so uh, a capacity of our facility 30, 40 years ago was probably higher than it is now because we have to allow for space for um, that kind of different kind of delivery instructional model where we can do collaboration and do that kind of group work and we can serve special populations in our buildings as well. The data in the bottom table is uh, just a duplication regarding capacity, same information, it's just by grade grouping at the bottom. Um, the current enrollment for, uh, for these, those facilities is listed there, your projected enrollment. You can see that your current and projected enrollment um, the projected enrollment goes down slightly in some grade levels. Um, it goes up a bit, like at pre-K, for example. Um, and then your utilization numbers. Currently, the pre-K building is being uh, pretty highly utilized. But as we go across the grade levels, pre-K, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, we see that utilization go down. Again, comparing that enrollment against the capacity. So we're, we have two columns here, our current utilization, our current enrollment against the capacity, and then the projected utilization, the projected enrollment against the capacity. And we're seeing that the trend continues that in K2, after pre-K, the K2 uh, utilization is the highest. And then as we go to 3.5, that utilization drops. And then as we keep going through the higher grade level, it drops, which I'm sure it's not brand new information to you all. I'm sure you've seen that trend in your district. Um, and this just kind of quantifies, I'm sure, what you've been seeing over the last number of years. So again, we'll be using some of that data to um, help us to inform those internal options that we then bring to Christine and the team. So I do want to talk about the educational adequacies. This is just kind of a graphic that we use as we enter into conversations with your uh, leadership regarding what do we mean when we're talking about educational adequacies. Primarily, we're looking at do you have the right types of spaces? Do you have the appropriate quantities, sizes? And then beyond that, uh, do you have flexible spaces? Um, are the spaces in the right spot? When I say right spot, that is somewhat subjective. But for example, you know, at a um, elementary grade level, for example, you don't want your speech and language therapy room to be right next to the music room or the gym where it's loud, that kind of thing. Uh, do you have appropriate daylighting? Do you have appropriate visual access and visual control? Do I have um, appropriate, uh, not only visual control, but acoustical control. Can I hear, again, those rooms next to me? Do I want to hear that or not? That kind of thing. So these are some of the topics that we talked about when we talked with your um, principals at your facilities. And the next few slides are simply kind of a summary of what we saw or what we heard in those conversations. And we tried to group them to the degree that we could by um, what I'll call program areas. So what you're seeing here is some of the um, ideas that were brought forth regarding core academic classrooms. Um, some classrooms are smaller than others. Um, there aren't enough spaces to do a lot of professional development. Some buildings have created spaces for that. Um, there are folks that are working out of smaller rooms than they could. Some are working out of larger rooms than they should. Um, and, you know, that's something that we see with facilities all across the country, that we see buildings that were built with classrooms and then large spaces like cafeterias, libraries, and gymnasiums. And we don't have enough of those what we call in-between spaces, spaces to serve small groups, spaces to meet one-on-one, -on -one, spaces for offices. 
And, you know, what I said to the principals and what I'll say to you tonight is that um, teachers and principals do a great job of having really good outcomes with their students despite the facilities that they're working in. And one of the things we want to accomplish through the facility master plan is to not only get the facility out of the way, but to allow the facility to enhance the instruction that's occurring, to make that facility a third teacher and really assist uh, the teacher in the academics that are attempting to, to, um, to deliver. So again, there are some oddly shaped rooms. There are different sized classrooms in different buildings. In some places, the furniture is too large to be moved around. Um, there's some potential needs uh, for uh, more room for special ed. Cooperative learning is difficult, which I mentioned uh, again for um, a lot of the facilities. Um, there's not enough office spaces, the workroom, the lounge in some buildings um, are not conducive. It kind of, there's like a, a break area and a copy of working area and it's pretty small and it's not really utilized very well. The multi-purpose rooms, cafeterias and kitchens were mentioned a number of times across especially the elementaries um, that um, having one room to serve all the purposes for gym, performances, uh, eating just isn't enough space, and um, we see that over and over again. When I plan facilities uh, for districts for renovations or new construction, um, I often like to plan at least two separate spaces, generally a cafeteria with a stage for uh, presentation performance and a separate space for gym for the appropriate physical education. Because if you take over the gym for any other purposes, you're taking away the need, the um, the space for an educational opportunity, the physical education. So, and in some cases, the um, kitchen is too small and they have some coolers and freezers out in the gym itself. So there were some building and site considerations shared with us as well. Um, again, they need more middle of the road kind of space, medium sized rooms. They have some small rooms and some large spaces, but not medium size. Um, there was a mention more than once of the need for community space. And that was something that we learned early on when we had discussions with Christina and Robert is uh, as part of this plan, we'd like to discuss potentially options for uh, community use. So we'll keep that in mind as we look at that facility data that I referenced uh, earlier. So, um, and then when we got into career tech education, visual and performing arts and electives, that tended to be more of a middle school and high school conversation. Um, and at the middle school, they have some space for woodshop, but that class isn't currently being offered. They currently offer art and gym, and they have a choir room, but that's not uh, currently offered. And then there was some discussion about um, CTE at the high school, um, and uh, we talked a bit about um, they have uh, a lot of older spaces that could be outdated. Um, but the culinary arts and the auto shop tend, are nice, but they could use some updates. Um, there was also conversation about not having access to the culinary arts from the exterior uh, to potentially allow more folks to take advantage of a restaurant there. Um, there was some kind of brainstorming going on in this conversation that maybe it would be nice to pair the restaurant on the side of the building with the access to the pool, the gym, the auto shop, to create some community partnerships. So while we were talking about potential adequacies or inadequacies, there was kind of some beginnings of um, thoughts about how to address some challenges and maybe how to take that forward into uh, facility options. There was a mention that um, the visual arts at the high school is on the second floor, which means that the kiln is up there too. There was some concern mentioned that maybe it would be safer to offer those courses on the first floor. Um, physical education and athletics at the middle school, there was a uh, mention of cheerleading, having uh, enough space and having uh, space to uh, where there are high ceilings to uh, practice in, and that um, the high school has trouble uh, scheduling multiple sports in the gym. And again, same uh, concern about cheerleading. And then I think the uh, reference to track being open to the public is that there's a potential 
potential safety issue there um, when you allow the public. There are ways to mitigate that, but it was just a concern that was brought to the attention. And then we just, as we started this conversation, folks started to think about, well, what else might we have or not have just district-wide, not building specific or not grade level specific necessarily. And one of the thoughts that bubbled up was the um, district currently has no confidential breastfeeding locations. It has no family restrooms. Um, and few of the family, or few of the restrooms in the district have actually changing tables. Um, there are not any uh, unisex adult restrooms, so it makes it difficult when there are lots of women teachers in a building to use a restroom, that kind of thing. Um, and again, the mention for a space for professional development to hold about 50 to 75 adults. And um, as we had that CTE conversation around high school, we asked the question about, you know, what are you offering currently? And here's a list of, of some things. However, um, the welding is not currently being, uh, not currently running through a teacher shortage, and they're exploring the teacher training program. And so one of the things that we want to do in this process is to learn a little bit more about what's offered in your neighboring district from a CTE perspective so that you can make sure that you're offering things that would attract students or allow students to stay as they move from the middle to the high school and um, stay in the district. So this, this, was, this summary here is just kind of our overall impression of data that we collected so far based on you know, those kind of data points of capacity, utilization, FCI, enrollment, projected enrollment, as well as the educational adequacy conversation. So we're seeing primarily that your facilities are underutilized. We know that your enrollment is declining. We know that yearly facility budgets are always a concern. Um, the acreage of the sites are kind of small. We know that we want to potentially solve in this facilities master plan. We're always asking the question, well, what are we solving for? And in this case, one of the things, among others, that we're solving for is potentially funding space for community use or how buildings could be repurposed. And then there are other considerations as we continue this conversation and bring others into um, reviewing options that will fold into the process. So with that, I'm going to um, open it up for conversation, questions, um, and anything else you might want to return to. So thank you for the opportunity to present what we've done thus far. And as I mentioned at the beginning, and I'll reiterate it here, our next step then is to work internally, John, David, and I, to finalize some options then to bring to Christina and Robert for input on. And once we have those, we'll bring them back, kind of refine those and bring them back to you all at your March meeting so that you can review those before we take those out to uh, for, for community input. So thank you again for your attention. We appreciate it. It's open. I mean, she can hear us, right? Uh, yes. I may, I may have to repeat for her, but yes. Okay, does anybody want to start? I mean, I have a couple, but I'd, I'd rather wait to see if somebody else answers I just the same question. Know, what, is the, what is this? I mean, I heard a couple of things mentioned, and like she said, I think maybe you had a copy and you saw it and something like that, and I haven't seen or copy or anything like that, so I'm wondering, what is this? So this is our internal facilities master plan. It is part of goal five of our strategic plan and looking at all of the buildings that we as a district own. And we've just gotten a bond approved, so we wanted to make sure we were being good stewards of the federal or of the local tax dollars and putting them in the buildings that would maximize for students. This is this is basically the firm that we approved hired. Uh, and hired to start to look at the usage of our facilities and come up with some potential options as to what we could put in, what we could do prior to spending money and then turn around and find out that we spent money on a facility that really is of maybe not that much value to us anymore. We wanted to make sure we spend the money that the public gave us properly. So that's basically what this is. This is just, uh, I guess you could say, an initial presentation based upon some fact finding that they've done in our district. They really haven't beat their heads together quite that much yet to get the options right. yet. 
this but is what just they've done is they've kind of looked at our Olivia. facilities yep. and they've looked at some numbers and things like that and this is just kind of like the opening this is this is what's going on right now and they're going to go back and I think they're going to beat their heads together for a while come up with a variety of options as far as what we can do with our facilities then they would come back to administration and then they would beat their heads together for a while and um, with those options as well too and then eventually options would be brought to us as a board and we'd be able to beat them up and decide and ask a bunch of questions about the various options. When you say the board, you mean all of us? or just All of us, all of us. They will present again to us the various options to the whole board and we'll be able to ask questions and beat them up as far as what's going on with this and what, what's this about and what's that about and things like that. We'll be able to peruse the various options that they have at that point. They don't have them yet, but at that point, and we'll be able to ask questions about them. Then they'll be taken to the public as well too, and the public will be able to peruse those options as well too and um, be able to provide, provide information or their feelings about those particular options as well too. Because ultimately the premise behind when you invest the money is the students and probably, you know, it's about student achievement, right? And for improving our facilities so that we can impact student achievement as well too. Okay, through the usage of our facilities and make sure they're using used properly. If we're underutilizing facilities and we're spending more money than we need to, that's less money that we can put into the classroom for the students, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're paying more in heat on a particular building than we should be because we don't really use that much of the building, it's probably better off to shut down that building. I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm just, this is just a, a general hypothetical, but it'd be better to shut down the building and use the money you save on the building to invest into the other facilities to make sure that we are putting the funds into those, whether it be through teaching, classroom instruction, mm -hmm. improving those facilities or whatever so that our students have better facilities to work in. Okay. Now the questions I have out of this, and there's a couple things that I'll bring up since I'm already on the floor. One is, one is I see some folks out here in the audience, and, and I recognize one of the faces, and I'm sure that they're probably here primarily for this presentation, they wanted to see this presentation. I just want to make sure that everybody here understands that if you want to give your contact information up here to administration, when we have that public meeting, I'll put pressure on them to make sure that you guys get a personal invite. It'll be public, there'll be a public notification as well too. But I want to make sure you took the time here to come and see this presentation because you're interested enough in what's going on with our facilities in the community and what's going on with our taxpayer dollars that I want to make sure you get a personal invite to anybody that's out here in the audience. So feel free to come up at the end of the meeting, give contact information, name, email, whatever you want to do. Okay. Second thing, um, I want to make sure we maintain as many options as we go through that process when we get to the public. I'm really fearful about making a lot of decisions without any public input at all. I think we should I don't think we should be eliminating options necessarily before it gets to the public unless there might be some that are just totally crazy that you know just don't make any sense at all but in general I want to take almost all the options that they come up with and that we come up with after we beat it all up to the public so the public can have their input on those options because ultimately this is about our community and the impact on the community the other piece to that is in planning with Wolpert, we may come up with two possibilities, go out and get community input, and the community may come up with a possibility that is different than either of the two that we present. So absolutely oh, community yeah. input is critical. And then the other thing that I had too is uh, where does the piece of empty property, it's a rather large piece of property that we have that does not have a facility, does this factor into this thinking? And yes, are you absolutely. and you're and you're yeah. aware of that prop, piece of property? We are. I, yes. Because okay. I didn't see it up on the chart. So. I'm sorry. Uh, you talked about us quote unquote banging our heads together, and we have done some of that internally already. And John and I were just doing that last week and starting to think about, well, what if you know this was if if this building was on that new site and this building you know was got a renovation, what might that look like? And so yes, we're absolutely keeping that in mind as we look at options for sure. So thank you for reiterating that. And um, yeah, we'll make sure to include that um, 
as a maybe even a, another slide so people can see if they don't already know where that piece of property is. Um, a couple of things that surprised that. me based upon the data that you provided us already, I have to admit, was I did not realize that our middle school is actually on the smallest piece of property that we have in the district. Mm. Yeah, and that's why it's Anchorage wise, it's actually on the smallest piece of property we have in the district. All the property of every one of our elementaries is larger than the middle school property. That, I thought that was strange. And I also found it kind of odd because of, I don't know, what we perceive as the condition and the age and everything of the high school. When you got into, what, I, I, have, I have shorthand down here, but I have com. Anyways, you had that one column where you had the percentages, and you said the early learning center was basically in a work condition, a condition that was 70%. Yes. And other than a maintenance garage, the high school actually is in the best. Hold on one second. I have to reset. I, I found that to be rather odd, too, because just walking in the various buildings. Yeah, it's as a percentage of replacement value. That's what I'm saying. So, so the, a, what that means is the, the, the value of that building must be a lot. Yes must be a lot. And the cost to reproduce that building would be, would be um, high. Uh -huh. um, you okay. done, Joe? I'm good. I'm um, good. My, my question was... Hold on, they cannot hear you right oh. now. I have to refresh uh, the Zoom meeting, which won't load currently. So please pause. You know, now I know what the teachers feel like when technology doesn't work in the classroom a lot of pressure. Welcome back, uh, Carrie Ann and John. Thank you so much for your patience with our technological challenges in Zoom this evening. Dr. Early, you have a question. Yes, yeah, so my question is also dealing with property, okay, because we know we can't expand the land. So for the buildings, the uh, percentages that you gave that each one of our buildings should sit on, none of them made that total. And so what do we do in those cases because you can't move Forest Park across the street? Right. There, there are, and I'm sorry, um, uh, Christina, you'll have to re-enable uh, re screen sharing if I want. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things, we'll look at that as we develop facility options. It might be such a case if, if one of the options is to, you know, consolidate facilities that one of those pieces of property might be vacated and you might be able to have that additional land for things like, you know, the, the fields or the play fields or that kind of thing that you might need instead. There also, um, you may be able to build up instead of out, and I think that might already be the case for you all, um, you know, build a, a two-story facility instead of a one-story facility, and that may be, um, give you a little more acreage. And this, again, there's no national standard, there's no... Um, on that, it's just kind of a good, what we call national norm, a good rule of thumb um, as you're planning those those facilities. So it's not that you can't have, it's just less than ideal. Okay, and then my other thing is the projections of like the amount of students that we will have, a, a, as you look at the numbers, come, would you, do you think that we would end up combining buildings as opposed to during reconstruction and or building new buildings? Or is that something that you have to get into as the study go on? That because was, you know, we are starting to explore all of those, all those ideas options. Um, it, as part of our options development. All of those things will be brought forward. Um, and you know, as we say all the time, we don't have, we only, we have the data on the page and we don't have the 
local history, which Christina helps to provide, and we don't have the emotion, which the community helps us to provide, right? And so we can, as you know, and that's why we're brought on board a lot of times, we can create those very objective options that say from a data standpoint, here's what we might suggest. And then when we bring it to the district, to the board and to the community, you all weigh in with those other pieces while giving us the history, the other, you know, social or emotional pieces that filter into these facility decisions then that help us filter out what might be a quote unquote good or a bad option. When we do bring options to you, we'll not only be bringing an option, we'll be talking and we'll have thought through to the degree possible that we can as an internal team and with Christina and her team, you know, what are the benefits and challenges of each of these? Because every option that we bring forward, there won't be one, it, a one, one option that will work for every person, but we'll, they'll all have their own benefits and they'll all have their own challenges. And you'll have to prioritize and mitigate the challenges and try to take advantage of the opportunities or the benefits that each option provides. So we will definitely get into all of that. Because I, what I, I, in my head, I'm thinking we have the middle school here and the high school here, our elementary is in the middle kind of surrounding, and what happens if y'all have to take a middle school, I mean, the, the elementary school away, that means a brother and sister can't walk together or be together or, you know what I'm saying, the high schoolers can't drop off that other child, like th those kinds of things. Yeah, and we, lo we look at that too, like what does that mean? If that elementary comes offline, so to speak, what does that mean? Where might those students go instead? What what impact does that have on, you know, transportation, busing them, walking, parent pick up, drop off, as you say, a right. sibling um, relationship and how that might affect, uh, you know, movement throughout the day. So those are all factors that we look at as we develop those options. Okay, and then my, my last one is the CTE option. Because we know we don't offer a lot of CT because we even had a welding program, but the welding teacher said I can make more money doing welding do, than being a teacher. Will we then look at options like if Roseville has welding, we would combine with them to have a welding program where our students can get a welding option, or is that something that we look at? So the well, central office team right now has already started to have some of those conversations. Okay. East Point used to be part of a CTE consortium with Gross Point, Harper Woods, uh, South Lake, Lakeview, and Lakeshore school districts. And that was set up um, quite some time ago prior to Schools of Choice. What happened when Schools of Choice came in was that CTE programs were then ways for other districts to, Grab students. to capitalize on <laughs> increasing their own enrollment. And what we've seen over time with our consortium that we were part of is that as um, leadership has changed, as priorities have changed, our consortium did not stay together as strongly as others. Um, East Point did try to get into the South uh, Western Macomb CTE Consortium, um, but we did not get in. Uh, we don't have, there are not enough seats in that consortium that exists. So East Point is in the process of exploring if another district is interested in being a partner with us so that we could offer a larger cadre of CTE programs without, it, it's very cost prohibitive to try to offer auto shop when this district um, removed their auto shop and the equipment a long time ago. But it would not, it. but Rose, um, Southlake actually offers auto shop. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we're in that conversation as well, Dr. Early, um, and it will help to um, craft and define what direction we go in um, based on some of our initial conversations and how those go. What, what our plan is as an organization now is to live into the CTE pathways that are approved for East Point Community Schools um, and do them really, really well. So uh, the public safety, um, health occupations, um, and then we're trying to get creative about how um, we can employ industry partners and, and make it advantageous for industry to be a partner. Um, currently, it is a barrier for us in that industry in many of the um, programs pays more than what our teachers get paid. And so that's a gap in our ability to offer programming um, that we have to reconcile. No. I'm sorry, I have one more, I'm sorry. 
I see a glance. Oh, well, I have one more. She did not tell the truth and has one more question. <laughs> I have one more Secretary. question. This one came while you were talking, though. Um, the direction of, of college, because I know we do uh, dual enrollment with... We have early college early, yeah, and dual college. enrollment. Mm -hmm. So would that fit in this category also of helping trying to figure out some of those roles of having the early college program or dual college program? Um, I think that those are less impactful on our facility. Okay. Um, because okay. it is a partnership which involves um, sometimes a professor coming on <laughs> campus or students going to yeah. um, the South Macomb campus for the courses. So it's less about what we do with our facilities, and that's more of a programmatic okay. um, question. Okay, that, so that wasn't a question. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for the work that you're doing so far. My question. It kind of got answered, but in the in the facilities like the ones that you say the utilization is um, below uh, the I guess student capacity. The the in those plans, would you look at um, when you look at the square footage and the and the acreage, or or so to speak, the square footage is the building itself. And the acreage is the whole groundwork or the layout of the whole school property. So with that being said, if there's buildings that could be removed and placed in other spots, would that be a part of the uh, plan that you come up with? Or would that be something that um, wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a, a, a viable option yet? not sure I understand what the question is let's say if we let's say we have um, 17 acres of, of high school land but on mm -hmm. six acres there might be a building that could be <clears throat> preserved and moved to a, another location let's say a location where it's school property but there's nothing on it and that would give us more room to build up our track or build up our football field? Would that be an option in the plans you all come up with or no? If, if I'm hearing the question right, I'm having a little trouble hearing. That's why I'm not sure. Um, are you saying that if the building is in good condition, would you move part of the building to another tract of land? Is that what you're asking? No, ma'am. I'm asking if there is a, let's say there's a, 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 a car shed or a shed that we used to use to house tractors and, and equipment for our CTE programs or something like that that's not being used. It could either be torn down or moved to a, another location. Would that be an option to give us more uh, for, uh, square footage to use to build up the track or build up the football field or something of that nature or would that not be an option? Uh, provided that that particular building is included in the square footage that we have for that facility. So, for example, if the, and I don't, uh, here, let me just get to it real quick. So, you know, currently the high school gross square footage is 305,000 square feet, right? And so if that particular facility is part of that 305, then yes, that would be a part of the options conversation about moving that piece, um, or, you know, or you know, deconstructing that piece. Um, I don't know if those kinds of outbuildings are included in your square footages or not, but we can certainly look at that. Okay. I have a question. My question is more about the timeline. You said you would be bringing options. Um, to the March meeting, March 24th, is that? Correct, yes. Okay, um, in that meeting, if I understood you correctly, there would be a public hearing at the same meeting. We haven't no. decided yet how we would okay. offer a public hearing at this time. Okay, that's what I was trying mm -hmm. to get an understanding because uh, until I hear what the public has to say, I really don't, and know what the options are as far as what they're saying. Uh, can't really ask for an assessment of the options because I don't know what they are. 
Well, that's, that's why I basically said what I said is that I want to make sure that the public has all the options to peruse and provide feedback to us as a board before we make any type of decision. Yeah. No, I, I know, get that. I and and, and that, that's what I said. And I think what the superintendent's alluding to is are we actually going to build it into a, a regular meeting and have it as part of a regular meeting? The options they're going to present us with on the 24th, that's not really... I guess you could say geared towards public input at that point. There will be another meeting after that that will be the initiative behind that will be to get public input, you know, before we make a decision. We're not making decisions on a 24th meeting. I okay. guarantee you right. that. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's probably what you really want to know, right? They're yes. just bringing the plans to Yeah, us. they're just bringing some options to us, and then we're going to invite the public at some point in the future to join us and give input to us. So we can make our decision based upon information from them, administration, the public, and everything, because we want to get it right. You know, you know, it's not something where we want to start start in one direction and all of a sudden say, well, no, we want we need to go in this direction or that. We want to make sure that all the stakeholders have had their input. The community has had its input because this is a, a big effect on the community so that we get this right and it's going to be in the best interest of the community. Okay, so, go ahead, Carrie. Ann. Generally, generally, um, in the way that I talked about it tonight, generally, like I said, we'll do uh, have an options conversation internally. We'll talk to Christina and her team, and then bring it to you all because usually, the board likes to see what are these options before we take it out to the community, so that we don't take something out to the community and the board says, "Well, we never saw that." Uh, so it gives you the opportunity to know before we take it out to the community what we're taking out there. And if something just is totally off the mark and you say this is just a non-starter, we just take that out of the mix. And then we go out to the community in a, in a meeting following sometime after March 24th um, to share those options with the, with the community. And as Christina said, we can work through the specific and logistics of that meeting and when and how it'll be held and all of that um but that that's our thinking is to we don't want to take something out to the community that you all haven't had a chance to even look at or see okay i get i got that i just wanted to make sure that the data from the community input would be shared prior to um or not at the same night because we've had some situations before we were presented with information and voted at the same night. I'm just trying to make sure we're not going oh. to do that. Right. Okay. okay. I think we're good. I have a question, too. I just want to know if any of your data is going to include, like, K through 5 buildings or K8 as an we're option. Look at all of that, yes. That'll all be John, on there? John and David and I have already started to start tossing those options around about okay. potential grade reconfigurations and that kind of thing. All right. Keeping your current configurations and also changing rate configurations. Will that also include, like, I don't know if you guys do that part, but if, say we went to uh, K-8, would it also, would you also be giving us the data on how much we would be saving in transportation? Uh, transportation costs, uh, we could probably get some of that data, uh, and sometimes depending on how easy it is to get it uh, from the district, um, or from you all, uh, but most likely we would be able to work some transportation costs in there. One of the things that we can do is to get um, operational cost savings. So let's say we have, you know, you have two, you have two K two buildings, you have two three five buildings, you have one six seven building right now, and if those buildings all come into a K eight, for example. I think we looked at that already and we said, oh, that'd be an awfully big K-8, maybe you have two K-8s. Um, then we would look at, okay, we're gonna go from five buildings to two, what is the operational savings by going from that? And we'll definitely have those costs. Um, transportation, we'll make a note to and ensure that we can get as close as possible as we can on that information for you. All right, thank you. That topic. All right. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann and John. We appreciate you joining you. us remotely and your patience with our remote 
challenge us this evening. And thank you for having us. Thank I appreciate you all. all the input and questions. Have a good evening. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, next we have D Board of Education, MASB Region 8 Board of Directors. We have one, we're allowed to vote for one person, one person only. There's a three there. Does anybody feel strongly about one? Okay, well, I would move that the board um, put a support behind, I, I guess it's pronounced. Bridget. Not Bridget. Brigitte. 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 McQuiston, Lake Orion Community School. She's the current incumbent. Well, I will. Do I, I made a motion. motion. I made Second a motion. Second that motion. Okay. So I guess, is there any discussion on this? The, the only thing I can say is it's she's the incumbent. I do know her. I know she works on behalf of the students, and if you read the bios, one of them talked about III and everything that they did, and the other one where she talked about particularly it's all about the kids is basically what was in her bio. And to me, I was just that's why I was asking, can I say that? Because that's <laughs> what I was going to say. It was like, I did this and I did that, and it was no, you know. What was beneficial to her. Yeah, it was like she passed the bond by herself and she passed all this she, stuff right. by herself and like, she did all this stuff she by herself. She went on to all the meetings and, and she did all the classes and she did, I'm like, look. And we know it's important that we have to work together as a team. So yeah. it's like, is, you know. Is this the same one that at the very beginning when I first started that we went up on Garfield and voted? And was this the same person? Um, well, is, it, is this the same the person? Yeah. Because we vote for Don Hubler, what, what is he? He's an at-large, isn't he, or something? Yeah. But there's now this one here. This one here, we just submit our vote as a district right after I've made the motion. There's a meeting tomorrow. And then you submit it to MASB, and then, and you cast the vote on our behalf. We don't have to go nowhere on this one. Okay. Because I know on some of them we have to actually go to the ISD and put our vote in one of our board members we designate that but not on this one okay is there any other discussion okay please call the vote yes 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 okay meeting adjourned at 804.